This morning I want to talk about how uh, God always had a resting place and a blessing for us. All throughout the Bible, he talks about how he is our resting place and that we can rest in him. The other thing he talks about all the time is how he has a blessing for us. Sometimes we can't see the blessing. Sometimes we wonder where is the blessing. Sometimes we get impatient. But we know that God is a faithful God. Amen. We serve a God who's a faithful God. And in Psalms 132, He says, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. For I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. And that psalm continues to go on uh, talking about the blessings of the Lord. So we know that in the Psalms, um, most of which were written by David, they're talking about Mount Zion, the literal place, but as we've been learning and as we know, Mount Zion for us is that heavenly place. Mount Zion it for us is that new experience that we have in God taking us on to maturity. And in this, we can always rest assured that God is resting. Where is he resting? In us. Why is that such a comfort to us? Because when we're filled with anxiety, when we feel like we've been forsaken or we're in a situation, we can always remind ourselves, wait a minute. It tells me in Psalm, the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired to make his resting place in us. And that is what God wants for each and every one of us, for us to have that faith to know he's resting in us and for us to experience that perfect rest in God. And in Jeremiah 50, it says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from the mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Here, Jeremiah is warning the people and said, You forgot what I said here in Psalms as recited. You forgot that in Mount Zion is where I rest. And what did they do? They walked away. They were always going after everything other things. They were always going after the world. And so what was happened to that, it says, I love how it says here, they have gone from the mountain to the hill. There's a difference between mountains and hills, isn't there? So I just came from California, as I know you heard last week. Bonnie did an amazing job here. I saw her on YouTube. Yay for Bonnie. We love Bonnie. And in there, I saw these mountains, and uh, in California, they're having a lot of rain. So I'm used to seeing brown mountains, but they weren't brown, they were green. I go, whoa, green mountains in California. It was very beautiful. And some of these mountains were huge. But then my son, he lives in a part of the city there, and he said, oh, mom, come look at my view I have. You know, I'm on top of a hill. Well, then I look, I thought, oh, he's gonna be on top of a mountain. Well, it was just a little hill. But it was a nice little hill, and he did have a beautiful view. So I'm thinking, well, why would someone want a hill when you can have a mountain? And that's what the Lord is saying to us. Why would you settle for the hill when I'm resting on that mountain of the Lord? I want to be on top of the mountain of the Lord. And so here Jeremiah is warning them, we can't forget our resting place. So easy for us to forget our resting place when circumstances happen in our life that God wants us to go through them, God wants us to get strong, but God does not want us to leave him. He does not want us to ever forget that we want to stay on the mountain no matter what. Which leads us to our story that we read this morning, the story of Ruth, which I know many of us have read before and are familiar with. And as we were reading, Ruth... uh, was the daughter-in-law of Naomi, and they had Naomi and her two sons. There was a famine in the land, and so the Bible says they went to Moab to find in search of food. And while they were in Moab, both of the sons found uh, Moabites for wives, which would have been like for us uh, non-Christians or whatever, and uh, married them. And what happened to Naomi is her husband died, both her sons died, So she's devastated. What am I going to do? I have these two daughter-in-laws. So she says, I'm going to go back to my homeland. I'm going to go back uh, to my family and my friends because I heard 
there's bread there. And she was trying to uh, talk her daughter-in-laws into going, into not going with her. But here we pick up where she is um, just getting back, and the people are excited to see her. Naomi, you're here. We're excited to see you again. It's been such a long time. I feel that way when somebody leaves church, and then they come back, right? And sometimes they come back a little sheepish. Sometimes they come back. And, but I know one thing at Mount Zion. If you come back, we're excited to see you. Everybody's excited to see you, and we're always welcoming uh, you with open arms here. And so she had gone back to the city, but this is what she says. She said to them, do not call me Naomi. That word meant pleasant. Her name meant pleasant. But call me Mara. That's the word for bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, the Almighty has afflicted me. So here's Naomi down in the dumps. Opposite of the song we sing, she went out full and came back empty. We sing, if we come in empty, he's going to send us out full, right? And so she was devastated. She was down so much that she didn't even want people to call her by her God-given name. And she believed with everything inside of her that it was God. It was God who had afflicted her, and it was God who was against her. But this was Naomi's perception of the situation. And Naomi didn't know what the rest of the story was. And so we're going to read what the rest of the story is to see how God used Naomi's situation to speak to her and to uh, perpetuate his everlasting blessing. She said she came back empty, and we, said, and we read here in verse 8, And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each one to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the, uh, the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So I put over this empty she wasn't exactly empty. She had two daughters. Hey, I was happy when I got my daughters. I have three boys. <laughs> she had two boys. When you grow up with all boys and a husband, you're happy to see a girl around. But she wasn't thinking in that realm. She was just saying, hey, I'm empty. I left here full with two sons and a husband, and I came back. But she wasn't remembering that she had two other people in her life. She had those daughter-in-laws in her life. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. She's talking here to Ruth. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do to me more also, if anything but deaths parts you and me. Wow. Something happened in that 10 years between that mother-in-law and that daughter-in-law. I hope my daughter-in-laws love me as much as this daughter-in-law loved Naomi. She loved Naomi. She had seen something in Naomi's life in this past time period that had spoken to her that had drawn her to Naomi's God, it says. And there was no way that Ruth was going to leave her mother-in-law. So Naomi thinks she didn't have anything, but there's a lot that Naomi had in the sense of she had a daughter-in-law who was willing to do anything for her. She had a daughter-in-law who loved her. When we're in our situations, we feel downcast and out sometimes. Nobody understands Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody can help me. I'm just down, down, down. And we sometimes don't think, wait a minute. We're not empty, but we're full because we have people around us. God puts people around us to encourage us and to love us. I know God puts Mount Zion Church and the people of Mount Zion Church to love other people. And if you're one of those that feel forsaken, or you feel maybe like Naomi, where you've lost everything, and you're all alone, and it's just you, I'm here to remind you, you are not all alone. There is love in this place. God provides people for us, and he puts around us, but sometimes we have to have that perception. 
We have to be the ones to say, wait a minute, I have a daughter-in-law who loves me and cares about me and will do anything for me. And this was the situation that Naomi was in. And in Ruth 2, this chapter 2 here, there was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of, I don't know why I can't say his name today, his name was Boaz. So Ruth, the Moabite, Bidus, said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of the grain after him in whose sight I may find favor. So when they get to the land, they find out they have this relative, and I like the way they said, a man of great wealth. Well, if God's going to bless you, I will give you a man of great wealth, right? I'm going to get one anyways. And he said his name was Boaz. And the story goes that they were hungry and they needed to go and they need to find <clears throat> um, grain. So uh, Naomi sends, her, sends uh, Ruth out to get the grain and is allowed to go to the fields of this relative Boaz. And they're allowed to glean from the fields. And this is what uh, is providing for them and they're eating with. And in continuing on, it says, Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to, to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered to him, The Lord bless you. I just put this scripture in because I think Boaz was a nice guy. Here he is. He was the overseer of his fields and he comes in town to check on the reapers and all the people there. And he blesses them. First thing he says is, bless you. I thought, wow, that's kind of nice of Boaz. Whoops. I'm um, sorry, where am I here? Okay. And then continuing on, we can read um, that what happens here is Boaz then lets Ruth come and glean from the fields, and Ruth finds favor there. She finds favor with Boaz. As Boaz is coming in, he says, who's this new person? And they tell um, Boaz, the story of Ruth, how she wouldn't leave her mother-in-law, how she was very faithful. And so she, he let her stay, and she, he showed her a lot of favor, and Ruth had a lot of favor with him. And she couldn't believe it. Ruth couldn't believe it. And this is her talking to Boaz here. So she fell on her face, <clears throat> excuse me, bowed down to the ground, <clears throat> and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? Remember, she was from Moab. And Boaz answered her and said, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and now you have left your father and mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Here she found favor. And Boaz says, I know your story. I heard your story. And now I want you to know that the Lord will repay your work. They also said she was a good worker. As she was working in those fields, they said she hardly took a break. So he's saying to her, the Lord bless your work, but more than that, he's saying a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel. Do you know God wants us to give us a full reward this morning? He not only gives us for our work, but he wants us to have that fullness in him. He wants us to have the abundant life. He wants us to have the abundant blessing. He's not just looking for a little blessing here. And this is what Boaz was telling Ruth, how encouraged Ruth must have been. You mean me? I don't even belong here. Sometimes we feel like undeserving of what God has for us. Me? God, do you know what I've done? God, do you know my life? Do you know I'm not even from here? It doesn't matter. When God says he's going to give you a reward, he's going to give you a full reward. Amen? I also put over this one that Ruth was the selfless one. Because Ruth wasn't really thinking about herself. I don't think Ruth went there and said, hey, maybe I can check out these guys and find a husband. No, Ruth was going there to feed them. And Ruth was going there for Naomi. So Ruth's intentions from the very beginning were very selfless. I admire this about Ruth and this integrity that she had. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, bless be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and dead. And Naomi said to her, talking to Ruth, 
This man is a relation of ours, one of our closest relatives. Wow, well, we turned Naomi around. One visit to Boaz, right? She sees that Boaz is taking a liking to Ruth, and she says, wow. She says, blessed be the Lord. He has not forsaken me after all. So this is the same Naomi that was just feeling forsaken. A one situation happens in her life, she sees that, and it turns her around. Do you know one situation can happen in our life, and it can just turn us around? I love that about God. He can just go, he can just say one thing, and our whole attitude, our whole situation, our whole countenance is turned around. And that's what happened in this situation. Naomi now, something welled up inside of her, and now she was saying, bless the Lord. And so Naomi came up with a plan. She says, I see this guy came, took a liking to you. We're going to see what we can do that, and we're going to see if this man will help us. This is our relative, and we want him to help us. So Naomi and her mother-in-law said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now what happens to Naomi? She now takes the focus off of herself and her pity party she was having, and she now focuses on God and she focuses on her daughter-in-law. She said, well, wow. She said, well, I want to do something back for you. I want you to feel secure. I want to see what we can do in this situation. And then that's where she came up with this plan on how uh, Ruth could go to Boaz and talk to him and find out if he could help them in their situation, being that he was a relative. And back in those days, the relative of your family could take... Um, could get the land of a deceased, of a, for a widow, of the deceased husband. If they were close relative, then they could marry that widow, and then they could get the land. So this is what they were hoping for them to happen. Um, and so Ruth gave her instructions on what to do, and she said, when you go there, she said, you're going to go in, you're going to see Boaz, you're going to lay at the bottom of his feet, and when he notices you're there, uh, you're going you're gonna to talk to him and you're going to tell them. And then she says, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. So she was telling him, wait on the Lord. When you go to Boaz and you give him the request, don't get anxious. Don't take things into your hand. Just sit and wait. He, Naomi knew about this man as a relative, and she knew he was a good man. So she trusted that God would use him to do the right thing. And sometimes in our life, we have to sit and wait. Sometimes we're in such a hurry. We have a request. We don't get our request answered, and we pity pot, right? Well, that's not what prayer, prayer is in the genie in the bottle. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is allowing us to pour our heart to God as he can pour his heart back to us. And when we do that and when we still stand still and stand strong, that's when God does what he's going to do in his perfect timing, not always our perfect timing. And so Naomi was telling her, we're going to persevere through this thing. We're going to stand strong through this thing. So you just sit and wait till he tells you uh, what to do. And I put here, do the right thing, because when we read the story to see what Boaz did, Boaz ends up going to great lengths in the sense of he goes, he finds out if he's indeed the closest relative. Uh, he's not, so he goes to the close, closest relative. He says, can you redeem this land? Can you marry this widow? And that man said, no, I can't. So Boaz takes it upon himself. He wants to do the right thing. He knows he's the next of kin. He knows this situation, and he goes before the people, and he says to them, he says, look, I want to um, marry this woman. I want to be able to restore this land to them. And so those that were in charge, um, they said, okay. And I like how the story, when you're reading the story, they did it by, instead of a handshake, used to be a handshake, now everybody's litigious and afraid to get sued, so they got to write everything down, right? But before that was a sandal. I thought that was funny. But they exchanged sandals, and that's kind of how they, how they agreed to it. But Boaz was here, and, and Boaz did the right thing. And 
here um, we're reading about after this has happened now in Ruth chapter 4, and it says, And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephra and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. And I put over this famous Boaz, because now the people had even more impressed with what Boaz had done. And so now they're blessing him. They're saying, may you be blessed by this woman that you've taken. And they're comparing it to Rachel and Leah, which bore the uh, uh, sons of Jacob and were blessed and all part of uh, that blessed generation. And he says, may you prosper and may you be famous in Bethlehem. You know God can make you famous, even if you don't want to be famous. Some people grow up and they want to be famous. I remember uh, my, one of my sons always said, well, I said, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to be when you grow up? He said, Mom, when I grow up, I want to be a professional hockey player. I said, you want to be famous? He said, well, yeah, I want to be a professional hockey player. I said, well, not everybody makes it in sports, you know. Maybe you ought to have a backup, uh, backup plan. And so if you aren't going to be a professional hockey player, then what is it that you would like to do? Well, then I would like to be owning the team. <laughs> and sometimes we have this in our mind of the little kid, right? That doesn't, doesn't know, just wants to do what they want to do and be famous. Well, Boaz wasn't doing this to be famous. Boaz was doing this because he was a righteous man. We need to look in our lives and say, we're doing things. We, God wants us to do things because they're the right thing to do. Not necessarily, might we not even want to do them, but he wants us as righteous people to think about what is the right thing to do? What is the thing that God is asking me to do? And when we do that and we have the faith it's then that God makes us famous. It's then what God um, does for us. He says that the things done in secret, he's going to reward for us in the open. And that's what happened here. And he talks here about the blessing of may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah. And in the story of that, that's not the Tamar that was David's daughter. This is a different Tamar. And this was the Tamar who was, uh, mar well, promised to, uh, was married to uh, Judah's son, and he died. And so she was a widow. So as the custom was, the next son was supposed to take her. But he said, forget it, I'm not taking her. And I'm not sure why that was. But he wouldn't do it, and so he died. And then Judah's third son came along, and Judah said to Tamar, well, wait till he gets a little bit older. But he got a little bit older. And Judah never gave, gave Tamar that son. So Tamar did, had no offspring. And in those times, that was a big deal. You needed to have offspring. And so she tricked Judah. And she went in, and she tricked him, and she had a baby by him. And that baby, what she's talking about, what was talking about here, um, became Perez. And you knew who Perez was. Perez was in the line of David, which is in the line of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing how God would honor an unjust widow like that? Some people would look at that story and say, oh, man, that lady's terrible. In fact, we do that in our I can't believe so-and-so did such and such. Well, you don't know if so-and-so or such and such is a Tamar, or you don't know if so-and-so or such and such is a Perez in the line and how God is going to use that situation. That's why God tells us to be so careful when we judge. And as we always talk here on Tuesday morning, to always give especially Christians the benefit of the doubt because we never know what people have been through. And more importantly, we never understand the whole story to know how God's going to use a situation. So here, they were encouraging Boaz from the standpoint of, we know God can use widows. We know that God can do anything. And so God is going to bless you, Boaz. And let's see what happens here. And so this was just to show this line that Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot 
Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot King David. So what happened when Boaz had his baby? Who was the baby? Obed. Who was Obed? The grandfather of King David. Wow. God did it again. He used to, a Moabite. He used a woman that wasn't even supposedly part of the line. And what did he do with it? He produces a son that's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Wow. If God can do that, God can do anything, right? He cares about people. He loves people. And I put over this, Boaz is uh, as being an example here and that generations changed iniquities have been broken. So in Ruth's line here, she would have been a Moabite, and if you trace it way back, they went off, they followed other gods. But God held true in that as Ruth came to the Lord, she was able to break generational curses on her side of the family. Isn't that cool? And so she was able to do that. Now she was able to be of a very prominent group, on a very prominent lineage. And no longer did she have to worry about these iniquities. You know that's what happens when you come to the Lord, your kids, you've broken those iniquities. When you break them off you, you break them off your children. Amen? And that's generational. And I just tell you a quick story. I wasn't going to tell it. Hopefully I won't cry when I tell it to you. But as I was in California, hadn't uh, been there in a long time, hadn't really seen my son uh, out there in his situation in a while. And five years ago, when he went out there, he found a church he told me about. And I said, what's the name of the church? And he said, uh, well, it's called Oasis. I said, oh, that's a strange name for a church, whatever. And that Tuesday, after Tuesday morning prayer, Pastor Lauren come, we're talking, Pastor Lauren and I were talking, he said, oh, yeah, he said, you know what? He said, uh, the Lord gave me uh, a name for our drug program that we're starting to help families and all that. It's called Oasis. I said, what? I couldn't believe it. So I felt pretty good about the church. But when I was out in California, I was able to go to the church that he went to. And when I walked in the church, I just, my eyes just welled up. It was an amazing anointing in that church. It was an amazing church. And I thought, I was so, over, I started to cry after the service. And he said, what's wrong with you, mom? I said, I'm overwhelmed that God is so faithful that he would bring you out here alone, a man alone, to California and after I lecture you, you know, make sure the church has this, make sure the church, you would find a church on your own that would be so anointed, so prophetic, so blessed, that it would be so much in God's personality to do. It's overwhelming to think me, being the first in my family to be able to raise children in the church the way that I do, and never knowing, right? We were hoping, but we're hoping. And to see that God's faithfulness that he planted in a church like that, iniquities are broken. Amen? And that's the boy. And I tell you this story to encourage you because uh, as my kids go through things, as our kids, we need those encouragements. We need to know that someone else has been through it. But that was my son that I've had so much trouble with and that now is doing art and testimonies on the Lord and testimonies about his life. So I know that God is breaking these iniquities, and I'm encouraged by our miracle basket today more than ever knowing that our kids are in the Lord's hand. And even I think about, well, you know, I went and I was a first fruit, but th the reality is we're not really first fruits because we have generational lines. I know if I look in my uh, mother's, my grandmother's line, there were priests in that line. And so we think we're on our journey by ourselves, but we're not. God is generationally faithful. Even if your kids don't have, end up doing what you want them to do, it doesn't matter because they're, your grandkids will, or your great-grandkids will, because God is a generational God. And here's what he did. Here's what Naomi has uh, to say here. And then uh, the woman said to Naomi, bless the Lord who has not left you in this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. Here it is again. May he be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, 
has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her bosom, and became a nurse to him. I put over this one God's perfected love. I was very inspired by our message on Sunday about God's love and Pastor Lauren sharing with us how important it is for us to see God's love and to have a mature love or a perfected love. And when we read this scripture and it it talks about the daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better than seven sons, we know that number seven speaks of completion or perfection. And that was the case for Naomi that this perfect love had worked through Ruth to Naomi, where now she could have never imagined her life would have been turned out the way. Naomi would have never known that King David, I don't think, I think it would have been too far from that, but Naomi could have peace to know that the inheritance would continue and that she indeed was blessed by the whole situation. And to sum up everything, the title of this message is that love never fails. Well, you didn't even talk about love. Yes, I did. (laughs) Because the story of Ruth is a story about love. It's a story about God's love. And if some people I know have a hard time remembering scriptures, or some scriptures I have a hard time remembering, but this one, I think everyone can memorize this one. Love never fails. And maybe when you're feeling like Naomi, or where you're in a situation of, I don't know how this is going to work out, remember this, love never fails. This was the scripture the Lord spoke to me when I was at my wit's end with this boy I was talking about. I didn't know what to do with him. And the Lord spoke, love never fails, love them up. And that's what the Lord is speaking to us this morning. Love them up. Amen? When there are people in our lives, there's situations in our lives, we don't know what, which way it's going to turn out, what way it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians, love never fails. And we learn that God is love. And you can read that chapter and find out all about uh, God's love. And our prayer needs to be, Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength, let your priests be clothed with righteousness. That's us. We're the priests and the kings. And let your saints shout for joy this morning. This morning, I want us to be able to shout for joy because the resting place of the Lord is ours. Because God, we have a love that God says will never, ever fail. And no matter what our situation is, God is saying to us this morning, I'm perfecting love in you. Lord, what's going on in my life? I'm perfecting love. Who are you? Are you a Ruth? You're the one pouring the love out, staying close. Are you a Boaz? Maybe you're the one that needs to do the right thing this morning, and this will encourage you to do so. Or maybe you're like Naomi, where you're feeling kind of down, you're depressed, you're anxious, you're fearful, you're bitter. You know, one thing, some people, as they get older, they get better, don't they? They look back on their life and they say, it didn't come out the way I thought. And maybe you're one of those. And you say, my life just hasn't turned out the way I planned it. Well, guess what? God has a plan for you. God plans our lives. We plan our life, and the Bible says he laughs at us. So I want to encourage you this morning, just like with Naomi, She didn't know there was something greater than her going on in this situation. There was something greater happening behind the scenes that Naomi had no idea. She knows that she got blessed even in the story that we read, but she had no idea generationally what that would mean and what that meant. We have the privilege to go and see that, and that's what I want to encourage you in this morning. If you are the Naomi, Be encouraged that God has a better plan. You don't see the whole picture. There might be disappointment. Maybe your life didn't turn out just the way that you thought it would. But know that God is a faithful God. Know that God has put Boaz's around you. God has put Ruth's around you. God is surrounding you with his love. Don't fight back. Don't stay in your pity party. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. Ten years is long enough. And Naomi came home. So I encourage you this morning, it's long enough. You come home to the Lord. Come and let the people of the Lord surround you with his love. Let God surround you with his love. 
and you can watch the blessings, the abundant life, and the peace and the rest that he's going to put inside of you this morning. Amen? So as we get ready for communion, I want you to just, um, just let's bow our heads together and see where you're at this morning. The Bible says that we should know our, where we're at with the Lord. Be in touch with him. And he's saying to us this morning, I want you to rest in me. So maybe you need a provision. You need a financial situation. You need a financial blessing. God says, rest in me. Maybe you've got those kids that are out of control. The Lord says, rest in me. Maybe you're anxious, you're fearful, you're not sure which way to go. God says, rest in me. Maybe you've got an addiction, a bondage. How am I ever going to get out of this? God says, trust me, rest in me, let me work in you. You've got an illness, a sickness, a bad report. God says, rest in me, trust me, I've got a plan, I'm going to turn it around. You're going to get a good report from a bad report. Maybe you came in empty. God says he's going to fill you. Maybe you came feeling forsaken. God says, we're not forsaken, we're forgiven this morning. You feel that there's no curse on you, but God wants to bless us. So Lord, we just come before you this morning. Lord, as we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, with grateful hearts, knowing that we are not an empty people, but we are filled. We are filled with your love and your promises, your healings, your benefits. And Father, we're just going to rest in you this morning, knowing that on the cross, you bore our iniquities. You were chastised for our peace. You took stripes so we could be healed. And Lord, we're very grateful for that. We profess that you are our provision. You are our rest. You are the one in which we put our trust, we put our hope in this morning, knowing that you're a faithful God. You are faithful to your covenant. Faithful, faithful God. And so as we just judge ourselves, you said that we'll be forgiven. We will be cleansed of all unrighteousness as we confess our sins. So let's take our bread now.